I'm excited to be able to talk to you about a few uh, topics near and dear to my heart. And this morning, for our first topic, we're going to talk about surfactant. And I'm going to give you an update about uh, current and uh, future uses. So our objectives for this talk is to discuss surfactant usage in diseases other than respiratory distress syndrome. I'm going to review our current approach using this insure technique or intubation, surfactant, and then extubation. We're also going to review some new minimally invasive surfactant therapies, including a, a project that I'm currently involved in that is close to being, uh, being completed. And then I'm going to discuss the future of surfactant therapy. So let's start with the beginning. And I want to give you a brief history of uh, surfactant and a brief uh, reminder of the biochemistry and physiology of surfactant. And as you watch this video, you're probably wondering what does the U.S. President John F. Kennedy have to do with a surfactant deficient atelectatic lung? And uh, one of the unique things, our quirks in history, is the death of Kennedy's baby. Uh, in 1963, just a couple of months before JFK was assassinated himself, his wife gave birth to a 34-week preterm baby who got the best of health care at the time, and unfortunately this baby died. But with this baby's death, millions of dollars flowed into research into this new field of neonatology to help us find cures for things like respiratory distress syndrome. So I know you all know this, but just to uh, review a couple of uh, quick points, quick thoughts about respiratory distress syndrome, remember that this immature lung is surfactant deficient. And these babies have respiratory distress immediately after birth. And of course, if this is left untreated, just like the Kennedy baby, there's a very high mortality rate associated with untreated respiratory distress syndrome. If you remember some of your physiology, these type 2 alveolar cells are important because they are the ones that secrete pulmonary surfactant. And uh, they aren't doing this until approximately 34 to 36 weeks of gestational age. As uh, the money flowed in and we began to unlock the uh, secrets of surfactant, uh, it was determined that the, uh, even though there's a large lipid component to surfactant, it's really those proteins that are most important, the surfactant protein B and surfactant protein C, which is what uh, the uh, currently available marketed surfactants contain a, proportion, a high percentage of to help treat respiratory distress syndrome. And if you remember Laplace's law, it is surfactant that helps us overcome this. It uh, allows us to have this reduced surface tension that increases the pulmonary compliance and then ultimately reduces the tendency for the alveoli to collapse. I always think it's important to pay attention to some of those epic articles uh, in, our fields of in our fields of medicine, and certainly this one in 1980 in The Lancet, which is really just a, a series of case reports, but it was the first reported uh, usage of uh, surfactant in a human population. And we can certainly see the increases in the PO2 uh, once these babies received surfactant. So one of the things I like about this conference is the ability to interact you know, with my colleagues here in Jordan. And a couple of years ago, a, a pediatrician named Dr. Raid from Hebron came up to me and said, you know, Scott, I would like you to talk about what I can use surfactant with, uh, what I can use to treat surfactant with in, uh, in, in other cases. What other diseases can I, can I, can I use this for? Um, and so this leads to the second part of this talk. Uh, and we're going to review a few things uh, that are uh, certainly uh, can be used. Uh, surfactants can certainly be used for. One of those is meconium aspiration syndrome. And I think this is one of the uh, more important ones. One of the new changes in the NRP guidelines is that we no longer routinely suction babies who uh, are, are, are born uh, when meconium is present. So please do remember this. We go straight and resuscitate these babies as we normally do, even if they're non-vigorous, but do keep your meconium aspiration devices available. That's because most of these uh, non-vigorous infants have already uh, sucked the meconium down during this uh, agonal uh, respiration uh, period. 
Meconium aspiration uh, certainly interferes with the surfactant. It causes surfactant dysfunction, causes direct toxicity, the airway obstruction, lots of different things uh, the meconium uh, can do with these babies that the thought is giving some exogenous surfactant may be able to help uh, improve their situation. So we commonly see this in our term, in post-term infants, this presence of meconium obstructs the airways, it causes atelectasis as well as areas of hypoinflation or hyperinflation, and this can lead to an increased risk of pneumothorax. And this is a very common cause of hypoxic respiratory failure and certainly uh, anything we can do to help these infants out, uh, possibly giving uh, exogenous surfactant you know, would be helpful. So we've looked at this in the past, and uh, this is a one uh, case report or series of case reports from 1996, and you can see they gave multiple doses of surfactant, and those babies did improve as you began to uh, give active surfactant, uh, wash uh, the meconium uh, out of uh, the airway. So it does appear that uh, surfactant does help with meconium aspiration syndrome. It can reduce the severity of illness. And the number needed to treat to have some type of beneficial outcome is uh, just six infants. Uh, it doesn't necessarily impact the mortality though, so please keep this in mind, but it is something I certainly would uh, recommend as we're trying to do what we can to help these infants who have suffered uh, from meconium aspiration syndrome. Do remember that multiple doses uh, may be needed. Other aspiration syndromes, uh, surfactant can also be helpful with, such as amniotic fluid aspiration, blood aspiration, or some type of aspiration of the gastric contents. Pneumonia, can surfactant be helpful to treat pneumonia too? Again, this is commonly going to be seen in the term or preterm infants. It can be either bacterial or viral. These infants are going to have respiratory distress uh, at birth if it's a congenital infection or, or sometime uh, significantly after birth if it's an infection that they have gained, uh, gained later in the hospital course. Uh, again, this is going to ha also have a high mortality rate of approximately 50%. And what happens with pneumonia is this uh, surfactant, the endogenous surfactant, appears to be deactivated by the uh, inflammatory cytokines that are released. And this causes the worsening of the baby's uh, respiratory symptoms. And so the postulated effect is giving extra surfactant helps reverse this process and will help improve their oxygenation and their ventilation once they have received this therapy. There is very little evidence to, uh, to, to, to definitely demonstrate that this is helpful, but it's something that we do regularly do in uh, the neonatal intensive care unit if uh, the circumstances are warranted. It's certainly something I would uh, consider trying. Pulmonary hemorrhage is something else we uh, can frequently encounter in the neonatal intensive care unit. Again, this can be term or preterm infants, uh, this is one of those things that will scare you to death because blood will come squirting out of the trachea, out of the endotracheal tube if they have that in place uh, when this occurs. And as this blood fills the alveoli, it is also going to inactivate uh, the surfactant. Now, this is one of those things, again, that uh, endogenous um, or exogenous surfactant does seem to help improve. Um, once the surfactant has been, act or has been inactivated by the blood, if we make sure that the bleeding has been stopped and has been tamponaded appropriately, uh, we can give exogenous surfactant to help improve the lung mechanics and hopefully help the baby uh, recirculate uh, this, uh, this uh, new surfactant to improve uh, the uh, situation and the circumstances. Again, there's very little evidence to support this. It's essentially a series of various case reports, but it certainly does have the potential uh, to reduce uh, mortality and morbidity from pulmonary hypertension. Just a word of clinical caution though, do make sure that the pulmonary hemorrhage has stopped before you consider giving a dose of surfactant because sometimes surfactant itself can cause a pulmonary hemorrhage or can, uh, can uh, worsen an existing one if it has not stopped bleeding yet. All right, let's talk about the insure technique. Uh, the insure approach, again, is intubation, giving surfactant, 
uh, during a brief period of mechanical ventilation and then hopefully rapidly extubating that baby. Historically, this has been done within the first uh, two hours of life. And the early studies that have looked at this, and we've been doing this for well over a decade now, show that the, there is a significantly reduced risk of death or bronchopulmonary dysplasia when you give a surfactant uh, in this approach. Uh, but as bubble CPAP and these non-invasive forms of ventilation have, more, have crept more into our neonatal intensive care units and we have been adopting this and using this much more frequently, we found that starting with a non-invasive form of ventilation is equivalent to this historic insure approach. And so our surfactant usage has gone down as we have implemented these, uh, as we have uh, implemented these non-invasive forms of ventilation. So this is our current approach at uh, Vanderbilt now on babies uh, that have received CPAP in the delivery room uh, with this uh, increased work of breathing and a certain percentage of FiO2 they're going to get surfactant via the insure method. Of course, if they're much sicker and intubated in the delivery room immediately with surfactant, the babies that are not as sick, we're going to continue on uh, with surfactant. This has, called, of course, has caused, of course, a decrease in our delivery room uh, intubation attempts and a decreased exposure of a certain set of infants to these uh, prolonged periods or even shortened periods of mechanical ventilation that are being shown to have the potential to harm the lungs. All right, so the third part of the talk, what is coming soon? And this is my favorite part of this talk because we get to talk about some of these uh, minimally invasive surfactant therapies. And Jens can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the Germans do not like calling this mist because this is a bad word in Germany. Um, so Lisa is one of the terms that is used in Germany because the Germans have been some of those people that have been pioneering this approach. So you're going to see either mist, which is what's typically used in the United States, or Lisa used in the literature. And this is a less invasive surfactant administration where we can use a thin catheter, such as an umbilical catheter or a specific type of developed catheter a laryngeal mask airway, or aerosolized treatments. This is the LISA procedure in action, okay? Uh, I've done this in the lab on uh, fetal animals. Uh, this is a video that I found of a neonatologist doing this in the Europe, and you can see he's intubating the infant. He's gonna be taking an umbilical catheter here. The baby is never subjected to a positive pressure ventilation. The baby is on CPAP during the entire time. He intubates the uh, trachea uh, with this umbilical catheter. Surfactant is uh, being uh, pushed into the trachea here. The stomach is being aspirated here. The baby is being monitored here the entire time. And they're giving this surfactant in a minimally invasive or less invasive way. Never exposing the baby to what is thought to be these harmful uh, mechanical breasts. So this is new uh, and we have been um, looking at this over the past a couple of years and meta-analysis are starting to come out now and as you can see here, Lisa when compared to all of the typical ways we have given surfactant in the past does seem to decrease the risk of bronchopulmonary dysplasia. It also and this is just new from, uh, from December in this meta-analysis, is it also decreases uh, the need for prolonged mechanical ventilation or any mechanical ventilation at all. So this is one of the things I would certainly consider uh, implementing, maybe in your neonatal intensive care unit or in your care with infants, uh, if you have a limited ability to do, the, to do mechanical ventilation for a, period of, of, uh, for a prolonged period of time. So this is another article that has just come out over the past um, couple of months uh, in December, uh, late December. And it's another approach to this minimally invasive surfactant therapy using a laryngeal mask airway. And this is the first report of this in uh, the literature. If you remember, a laryngeal mask airway is a device that goes down and uh, cuffs uh, the uh, larynx. Uh, and what they did in this study, because these uh, devices aren't small enough to go in our smallest infants, 
This was capped at babies uh, greater than 1,250 grams uh, between 28 and 35 weeks. And they used this device, this laryngeal mask airway, on infants requiring some amount of oxygen. They weren't incredibly sick, but they certainly had evidence of respiratory distress syndrome. And they proved that this was something that was safe and efficacious. Uh, once the laryngeal mask airway was in place, they squirted surfactant down it. They checked the uh, gastric aspirates of the stomach uh, to see uh, what percentage of surfactant actually made it down into the lungs and what percentage was maybe in the stomach. And surprisingly, a large percentage of the surfactant uh, actually appeared to make it down into the lungs. And this did increase the rate of CPAP success uh, in these babies and kept them off of the ventilator and potentially that uh, ventilator induced lung injury that leads to the bronchopulmonary dysplasia from occurring. All right, so what is the most attractive approach to this le least invasive surfactant therapy? And I think that's gonna be something that can avoid any manipulation of the airway, okay? Because again, with the video we watched earlier, they had to stick a laryngoscope into the baby's mouth, tilt the baby's head back, and insert that little tube. We also want something that's easy to administer. And so I think this aerosolized approach in this study that we're participating in in, the, uh, in our center, along with 24 centers in the United States, uh, currently we're up to over 300 patients enrolled. We're gonna cap this at 450, so this should end uh, probably early summer, late spring. And uh, this is, giving surfactant via aerosolization. This is an old idea, something that has uh, been kicked around since the 1970s, but because surfactant is essentially soap has been something that's been very difficult to do. Uh, but this uh, study seems to have overcome some of those difficulties of the foaming. This is what essentially happens at the area of the alveoli. This is what this looks like. It is essentially a pacifier that goes in the baby's mouth, okay? Uh, this is the setup at the bedside. So you have the uh, blender with your flow here. This is surfactant that is placed into this little chamber here, this aero chamber with a, a piece of tubing that goes into the baby's mouth and it aerosolizes a continuous stream of surfactant into the baby's oropharynx, anywhere from about 45 minutes to about an hour and a half. This is what it looks like in real life. Okay, this is a patient that I had uh, just a couple of weeks ago. You can see that he's tolerating it rather well. And as he's uh, sitting there uh, breathing, there's a certain percentage of that surfactant that is making it down into his lungs and help improving his systems, and we can actually uh, see that on x-ray. It's a pre-aerosolization x-ray on a baby, a post-aerosolization x-ray on, on, on the baby afterwards. Significant uh, improvement, you know, both in our clinical symptoms and in what we are seeing uh, radiographically. All right, so pretty neat. Uh, I think this is something that's gonna be on the market probably maybe later this year, probably next year, certainly something that will be helpful uh, if you don't have the skills to intubate babies. I certainly think it'll be something that'll be helpful uh, to everybody because it's gonna help the babies because they aren't gonna have to go that, undergo that uh, traumatic or what can be a traumatic procedure. Dr. Governor, please, can I just finish within five minutes? I know we started late, if you don't mind. I can, yes I can. I'm, I'm getting close to wrapping up now. And in conclusion, as we begin to wrap up, I'm going to talk about just a couple of other things that we're working on with surfactant, sort of the future of surfactant. Bronchopulmonary dysplasia has been one of those uh, things that's been the bane of uh, the existence to neonatologists and treatment of uh, preterm babies uh, for years. Of course, this is inversely related to gestational age. Most babies do recover from this, but as you can see, our rates of bronchopulmonary dysplasia has actually been increasing over the past decade because we've gotten better and better at treating the tiniest babies. So one of the things that also is coming down the pipeline is using surfactant to deliver medications like budesonide to uh, decrease the inflammation in the lungs, to try to decrease the risk or the degree of bronchopulmonary dysplasia that these babies have. 
So there's some uh, interesting studies going on both in China and in the United States. These early Chinese studies have certainly shown evidence that bronchopulmonary dysplasia can be uh, decreased or uh, treated using surfactant as this vehicle. There are also some synthetic surfactants that are continuing to be worked upon as well using the surfactant protein B and C. Uh, and this would be important because uh, these uh, synthetic surfactants resist an activation better. There's no batch to batch variability. And these can also be customized to allow delivery of certain drugs to the lungs. So let me close with some clinical implications for you, some take home points, some things I want you to remember. A rescue surfactant should be considered for infants who have hypoxic respiratory failure. Again, to answer my friend's question, if you have some things like pulmonary hemorrhage, meconium aspiration syndrome, sepsis, pneumonia, please consider using surfactant in those situations to help those babies. We need to use CPAP or some other non-invasive ventilation support right after birth to help these babies, but don't hesitate to offer them surfactant when they need it, okay? And currently that's being done by intubation. But there's gonna be some babies that these less invasive techniques that we're talking about may be helpful with. Uh, certainly if you're in a situation and, and have good skills and feel confident trying that LISA procedure using an umbilical arterial catheter or some other type of small tube to intubate the trachea and give surfactant that way and do that safely, uh, gain some experience doing that because I think your babies are going to benefit from that. But there are going to be some techniques and devices coming down the future, I believe, that's going to make surfactant delivery easier for everybody, including the pediatrician that's out there in, in an area that is going to need that help and that assistance and may not have the skills uh, required uh, from regular routine intubations on babies all the time. We're going to continue to have uh, research developments that are going to, going, to, going to benefit babies in the future and are going to continue to allow the uh, growth, development, and success of surfactant therapy that we've seen over the decades. Thank you very much.